I will now hand over the microphone to our moderator, Géraldine de Bastion, who, um, apart from the French name, does not speak French. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much for, <laughs> for having me here and hopefully enough English to moderate this session. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Geraldine and yeah, I'm very proud to be moderating this session. Um, maybe a few words to kick off with. Usually sessions at CCC come together because one person or a team of people hand in a topic that they feel they would like to talk about here on one of these stages. This session came together because several people handed in sessions where they wanted to address how they're trying to build communities or spaces that are specifically feminist, diverse and inclusive. And we thought it would be a great idea to give not just one person who handed in a session or two people, but all the people who handed in sessions on this topic, the stage. So this is how the sessions came together, by us grouping together different submissions on the topic. And so I'm very happy that we have um, five very interesting and excellent humans here to speak on the topic matter and be presenting their different approaches and their different strategies to building feminist spaces and communities. And I'd like to welcome them here on stage. So um, first up, we have Hong Fook, who runs FOSS Asia, which is a community in Asia, Southeast Asia, for developing software and hardware, specifically open source. Welcome, Hong. We have Ajem and Sora from Le Reset, which is a feminist queer hacker space. <laughs> Welcome. We have M. O. Sullivan, former hackerspace and Maker Faire organizer, now researching how to improve women and non binary people's engagement in maker spaces. Welcome, M. And last but not least, we have Lena Moore, who's a UX designer from Stuttgart, started an initiative called Ready to Code, teaching young girls to code. Welcome, Lena. So, and as I said, my name is Geraldine de Bastian. I run a community called the Global Innovation Gathering, which is a network of different maker spaces, hacker spaces, different kind of innovation speakers, makers and innovators across the world. Um, so a quick uh, housekeeping note for this session. The format is that we're going to give each of the teams here on stage the opportunity to present their work to you in about seven to ten minutes. And then we're going to gather here to discuss the difference and the likenesses in our approaches and in our perspective, experiences and ideas, and then we would like to invite you all to join this discussion and open the floor. So to kick things off, I would, uh, I would invite you first to share a little bit the story of FOSS Asia and your work in the last 10 years, Hong. Thank you. <laughs> I did not expect that I would go first. But that's <laughs> So, um, hello everyone, my name is uh, Hong Phu Deng, or HP Deng, if you want to look for me on the web. So today I will talk about um, how I get involved in open source community in the first place, and uh, also some highlights of my work at Force Asia during the past uh, 10 years. Before that, a little bit about my background. I was born and grew up in a small town um, in south of Vietnam. Uh, it's, it's called Kento. I don't know if any of you have been there before, but it's about 200 kilometers south of Ho Chi Minh City. This is my um, first 20 years uh, of my life, so I've been always uh, feel like a confusing uh, little girl. 
because I keep wondering what I really want to achieve in my life. Um, my family, my parents were not so were poor at that time. In 1987, most of the families uh, were poor due to the we just finished the war and then the reform of, of Vietnam. My parents been working very hard so that me and my sister could have a better future. And the only motivation that I have in my life until I was 20 to get a very good job somewhere after graduation so that I can earn some money, take care of my parents, and be able to afford something that I could never have when I was a kid. Uh, so that is uh, what I was thinking when I got to 20 years old. I went to school, I studied super, super hard, but I never really interested in school. And I also don't understand so much what I learn and get out from school. I just know that if I study hard, I will have a good future. In 2007, I met Mario Belling, who later on became my mentor and also partner later on. Not on Tinder, but um, at a free event, <laughs> free technology event in Hanoi. In 2007, that was the first time I learned about free software. In the same year, I switched to uh, from Windows XP to Ubuntu and started to use, to use open source. Since then, so I uh, started to involve with different user groups in the region and also um, contribute small, uh, small bits like localization into some software project. At the same time, I also learned how to submit a bug report and make an issue to different projects. And by involving in the open source community, I got to meet so many interesting people that inspire me. So I always have very uh, cool conversation with pe people who've been involved in one project for over 15, 20 years that really inspired me how people can be so persistent and continuously work on something for so long. And when they talk about their job, they're so um, positive and genetic, even though like, it keeps repeating, but they're very patient. And when I'm involved in the community, it's so good that people always like very patient and, and took their time to explain to you when you don't understand, uh, when you don't understand something. So uh, two years later, in 2009, Mario and I decided to found a Force Asia organization. So Force Asia, uh, the goal of Force Asia is to bring together and inspire community uh, across Asia, across different communities, to build a better future with open technologies. Since then, we have developed so many different projects uh, with the Force Asia community. So these are some of the uh, software and also hardware projects that we've been working on. Suzy AI is an alternative to Alexa or Google Home. And Pocket Science Lab is our newly re released open hardware project. You can find all of the projects on, uh, on GitHub of Force Asia, actually. Event Yay is an event solution that's similar to what you have here, uh, the, the FRAP, just scheduling and also tickets uh, selling open source. It entirely built by the Force Asia community. Uh, we also organize a lot of events, conference, and meet up throughout the regions. One of our biggest events is the Force Asia Summit. Uh, happen every year in March in Singapore. Throughout the year, we also have smaller uh, workshops and events in China, in India, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, many other places. Um, some of the highlights of my uh, last 10 years, in 2010, it was my first time enter Europe. It was so difficult to get a visa to come here. I know for from, from many of you, but it was a big thing for me to enter Europe for the first time. I got invited to the Labour Graphics uh, meeting. This is the photo taken when I was giving a talk. You can see that I was super nervous at that time. And uh, the next week after the talk, I went to dinner with a group of friends, the people from the liberal graphic communities. I was the only girl, but I did not realize that until somebody commented on my Facebook while well, you were the only girl in the picture. But I was really cool and very welcoming in the meet to the community. 2012, um, we built a, a hotel in um, our hometown, uh, Kento, and we labeled it the open source hotel. Um, you can look up Hotel Soi is the name um, of the place. So basically, it built by uh, the open source community member. So we set up uh, the, the, the the wireless network with uh, OpenWRT. Uh, I did the entire wiring for the telephone myself. I did it for three weeks, but I was very proud of it. And we have uh, the decoration inside the hotel. 
is donated to us by the liberal graphics community, so by some artists in, in that community. And in this bay, we hosted a lot of uh, workshops, and we hosted many open source contributors at our place. So we have DBN developer, we have game contributor, we have people from all over the world to come and stay with us uh, in this bay here in, in Vietnam. In the same year, I also hosted the group of artists and is a designer that I met in Brussels in 2010 in Ho Chi Minh City. So we did an um, open source design week in um, in Saigon, and. Uh, Surprisingly, more than 40% of the participants are female. So what we did in, in this design week, we show people uh, how to make artwork with free tools, with free software, and we, at the end, we also make an exhibition, what kind of um, uh, work that you can do with um, free software. In 2014, it was my first time attending um, the CCC, and this is the first person that I met in the speaker room uh, who spent several minutes of his valuable time to explain to me what is the difference between free software and open source. Um, <laughs> but I was um, very happy. I, I was also a speaker at that time, so we got a photo together. 2016, uh, we launched Code Hit program, which is uh, an online coding program run by the Force Asia community. So the goal of, the, of this program is to help young developers uh, and contributors to start to work in open source software and how to become an active contributor to open source. So we have uh, our Force Asia members to, to guide them. So everything happened on, on GitHub. Uh, we have GitHub channel where people can post questions. And at the end, the winners uh, will win a trip to, uh, to the Force Asia Summit and, and present about their work and experience and during the program. 2018, so we um, uh, released our uh, pocket science lab to the market. So the project been going on for the past uh, two years and we will finally produ produce uh, them in, uh, in China and now started to distribute them all, you know, all over the world. So we have a, a, um, a shop in Japan which is sold out within two days. Uh, we also distribute in India, in, in Singapore, in Europe, and it's been piloting in school in Singapore, in India, and also in Vietnam. So basically, uh, it's a small device that helps you to, to make science experiment. It's an oscilloscope with a lot of logic and a lighter and many different functions. We have a workshop here as well at the CCC if you want to, um, to find out more. Okay, some of my uh, mm, so uh, my approach and lesson learned. So there's a question about what strategy uh, that you do to engage many people in the community and how to grow the community. So what I learned from the past ten years, uh, the first thing is to be sincere with whoever you met. That how uh, my reaction in the community to be sincere with people. Um, uh, empower the people in the community, just like when I first joined the community, uh, the more responsibility to give to, uh, to people, they, they feel empowered and they, uh, it's also better to scale up the community. Motivation, uh, in order to work with people and to find the, the right approach, you need to understand the motivation behind individuals and it's really um, important to grow the community. And. Um, my philosophy is it always better by sharing. So we share our knowledge, that's the reason we are here, we share our resources, and we bring people together. Uh, finally, in the Force Asia community, I make friends, uh, friendship is important over the year, and I, I know that the people that I've been working with or engaged with will be friends for life. So that is a good thing about the um, free software community. And next year, 2009, will be our 10-year milestone of uh, the Force Asia organization. We have a big celebration in Singapore between March 14 and 17. If you happen to be there or you plan a trip to Asia, you are very welcome to join us. The website 2019.forceasia.org. And here at the CCC, we have a group of Force Asia members flew in from Singapore, from, from France, from Spain, and, and also in Germany. We have a laser cutter here built by a Force Asia member in Singapore, an open source uh, laser cutter. Uh, the small picture here is a Kiwi Carry, this, and it's uh, at our Force Asia assembly if you want to check it out. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us or you want to uh, look for me at the end of the talk, you can. Uh, shirt on the navigation app for Force Asia, and our number is A575. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Hong, for that introduction into FOSS Asia and your work. Ajahn and Sora, would you like to go next to present the reset? Okay. So uh, we both come from from France. Uh, we are part of Le Reset, which is a, a, a feminist and queer hacker space. And uh, we're going to explain a little bit uh, what we are doing, why we are doing it, and how. Um, so um, our hacker space welcomes uh, actively uh, people who usually do, do not uh, feel safe or included in uh, many other hacker space. So, mostly queer persons and women, um, because uh, most of uh, straight men feel really entitled to learn and share what they learn and uh, teach everything. And uh, on the other side, you have uh, queer persons and women who have a major imposter syndrome uh, when it comes to technology. Um, we observed so these things uh, and also that uh, the solutions to fix our issues are also uh, designed by straight men so they are not adequate uh, with our, our issues and that uh, we have a big lack of transmission in our communities so uh, as we were uh, the geeky ones uh, around queers and the queer ones around geeks we did uh, the, the reset to have a space that is the intersection of queer and uh, geek people. So it takes place in a, a queer bar in Paris every Sunday. And uh, I'm really scared, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, we started in 2016 and um, we speak directly to women and queers so that they feel welcome and included and would come to our space. Uh, we built a, a code of conduct that we may discuss further, uh, that we embody, so we endorse it and not just write it somewhere. Um, so, uh, our, our, <laughs> Uh, our basis are uh, a feminist ethics uh, based on the ethics of cares by uh, John Chonto. We do workshops for beginners uh, every session and we really um, insist on the things for beginners. Uh, the workshops are mainly hosted by queer or women uh, and we do not treat uh, differently uh, Infosec, coding, gaming, uh, crafts, uh, care practice, and all the things. We do not uh, make a hierarchy. Um, we uh, analyze uh, the power dynamics uh, with material feminism, and most of our projects are uh, cyber feminist. So I'm going to talk a little more about some projects that we have at Le Reset. Um, so I, I took three different examples. So the first example is the crypto bar. So it's basically a one-on-one -on -one, uh, crypto parties uh, with just one person, uh, as they were uh, launched by Asha Wolf. Um, and those um, um, security talks, they are mainly oriented towards cyber harassment because um, women and queer people usually ask us um, about security issues when they have trouble with cyber harassment. And so we have identified it to be the main threat model uh, for us and not like the NSA or something else. Um, another example of a project that we have is everything about health reappropriation. Um, so as uh, women and queers, um, our health is often in the hands of doctors that don't explain stuff to us or that don't do what we want them to do with our health because they have norms that we're supposed to follow. And so we work uh, around, uh, we work with transgender people around hormones and also um, with uh, tran trans people and women around uh, gynecology. And so we have uh, a partnership, partnership with uh, women doing self-gynecology um, workshops. And so we create zines and we share knowledge and practices about those. And we also have a lab project that is, that is inspired by uh, the Ginepunk Lab uh, from Calafou and also by the Open Source Eustrogen Project from Mary Magic that was presented in the CCC last year. And so uh, the goal of this lab project is to take and analyze our own cervical smears so that we can do an, our own analysis uh, with it. 
And the third project I wanted to talk about was the Queer Games. So the Queer Games is an artistic and political movement that was initiated by Anna Entropy and Matty Bryce. So the idea is that they're using game design as a tool to criticize oppression systems. And so we're doing uh, monthly Queer Games workshops uh, in order to empower queer people. And we empower them through rendering our own narrative visible through video games and also by learning skills to make our own, vi our own video games, even though uh, most people who come don't have any idea of how to code. So we uh, also learn coding through it. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction into your work. I think a lot of points raised that we're going to debate also in a minute. Em, can I ask you to go next? Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't have any slides, but I do have some notes. Um, and my story is maybe a bit different to um, my other panelists, because um, I don't come from a specifically feminist organization. Um, I live in Brighton in the UK, and our hacker space is called Build Brighton. Um, it started in 2009, so it was a fairly early hacker space in the UK. Um, it grew out of an existing meetup that was focused on robotics, um, and some of the people involved in that group decided to set up their own hacker space, um, so it began fairly organically. Um, it was inspired largely by the early US hacker spaces. Uh, in particular, Mitch Altman um, visited um, the robotics meetup when he was in Brighton and basically said, hey, you look like the kind of group who should start a hacker space. Um, and that kind of like, triggered the idea to go and set one up. Um, so it followed the same kind of um, ad hoc kind of duocracy structure. Um, it had some informal leaders, but things were kind of largely decided um, by group consensus. Um, for example, when we first moved into our own dedicated space, um, we spent the first couple of years meeting once a week in a co-working space, and then in 2011 had an opportunity to get our own workshop. And the decision around whether to do that was put to the entire membership, around whether we wanted to take on that responsibility, those extra costs. Um, and that decision was passed by consensus, and that's kind of how things have typically been done. Um, in terms of activities, um, there's a lot of electronics projects typically, um, especially with it growing out of the robotics group. Um, the laser cutter has always been really popular and was one of the first tools that was bought by the group. Um, and we've recently had lots of woodworkers coming in because we do have a fairly well-developed uh, woodworking shop. Um, and in terms of gender diversity, it's also a fairly typical hacker space. Um, there's currently 115 members, of which around 10 to 15 percent are women or femme presenting people. Um, and the, the, the aim of that statistic isn't to point out like, how low this representation is in this particular space. Um, it's to highlight that this is a typical number for a hacker space. Um, for me personally, um, a bit like Hon Fook said, I'm used to being in masculine spaces. Like I trained in media production originally, which is very um, male-dominated. Then when I went to work in IT, it was normal for me to be at events um, that were mainly men. And I suppose I just got used to this, and it became like invisible to me. Um, at the time, I was working for a software development company in Brighton, um, and the company had two offices, one for the technical team and one for the rest of the staff, um, so like admin team, uh, production team, HR, finance, and so on. Um, my desk was in the tech room, and I looked up one day and realized that I was the only femme-presenting person in a room of 20 men, and it took that to, um, to kind of jolt me back into realizing how weird this situation was. Um, and I also realized that um, Build Brighton, my hack space, was a similar environment as well. Um, and I became really interested in why this was happening, um, because hacker spaces, they're theoretically open environments, um, like our space, anyone can join. Uh, membership is on a pay-what-you-can basis from five pounds a month. Um, so the financial cost to entry are very low. Um, but we were still seeing the same issues as in other technology environments, um, in that uh, women and femme people were very underrepresent underrepresented. Um, and I saw this as a useful opportunity uh, to look at the, the cultural issues that continue to prevent women's engagement in technology spaces, even when some of those structural and financial barriers have been removed. Um, and the reason this was really important to me as a topic was because, like, for me personally, joining 
my hackerspace was an extremely empowering experience. I didn't have much experience before with DIY, with hardware, with working with materials. Um, and joining that community and having access to those tools and that knowledge had a huge impact on how I see the world around me, um, on my confidence to fix and adapt things when I need to. And I really want more people to have access to that empowerment, um, especially people who don't necessarily have existing experience with technology. Uh, so in 2016, um, I began my PhD looking at how some hackerspaces and makerspaces have been more successful than others in engaging women and femme people. Um, I'm currently still in the data collection phase of my research, um, but I visited various hackerspaces and makerspaces around Europe and the US, uh, spoken to lots of people from these spaces, and seen kind of a wide range of approaches to dealing with gender diversity, uh, ranging from acute hostility towards any suggestion of uh, specifically trying to engage women, um, right through to spaces that have made this a core part of their group culture. Um, so I hope that range of perspectives um, can come in useful to the discussion today. Um, and I'm also currently putting together a zine um, with contributions from hackerspaces and makerspaces that have developed inclusive practices, um, not necessarily focused on gender, but also on engaging other underrepresented groups uh, like people of color, people with disabilities, um, people with lower social economic statuses, um, because I think it's really important that those practices are publicized as widely as possible so that other spaces can learn from them. Um, so, if any of you have any suggestions about spaces that should be included in that zine, um, please do email me. Like my, um, my contact details are on the far plan, um, and I would love to hear about any spaces that you could recommend. Thank you, Em. And last but not least, Lena. Yes. Um, do you have to do that? Um, I'm Lena. I'm one of the three founders of Ready to Code. We are an organization based, based in Stuttgart in the south of Germany. And um, our story started, um, so no, first what we do is uh, we inspire women and girls to learn how to code and to work in tech and support each other. And um, there are two main reasons why we do what we do. I think the first one is quite obvious that there are not enough women who work in tech. And um, the second one is more personal because uh, I am a user experience designer and part of my studies was learning how to code and I found it extremely difficult because I had all these biases and pictures in my head and I, I just knew that I was going to fail at coding before I wrote my first line of code. And um, I was not alone with this. I um, saw this in a lot of my friends and a lot of my, um, yeah, a lot of the girls who studied with me. And um, the good news is that um, we had to pass the exam, so we sort of had to learn it. And I also had really great and really patient friends who not only taught me um, to code and taught me the facts, but also um, convinced me that I was able to do that. And the moment um, when it clicked, like, like you said, that was a really empowering moment because I felt like the, um, not only the knowledge opened a whole new world of opportunities, but also the self-confidence that I gained through that. And that is what we also want to share with other women and girls. Um, so what we do is um, we run workshops for women and for girls, and like Le Reset, Le Reset. I hope I said it right. <laughs> um, we make sure that they are for beginners so everyone can participate, and I think we're probably going to talk about that as well a little bit further. And um, we also have a networking event that's called Cocktails and Code, where women in tech um, can meet and connect and share their experiences. And um, we organize lightning talks from female speakers, so um, yeah, people who are new to tech can come and yeah, it's really low level and everyone can participate. And um, we also organize different events. For example, um, a couple of weeks ago, we organized a social hackathon. And I think what we do a little bit different is that one of our founders is, um, uh, is, is a guy, and a straight cis guy. So a lot of the volunteers that are working for us are also male. And um, we had a lot of good experiences with this um, because we think it's important to 
include everyone, but um, we talked a little bit before, and I think we're going to have a discussion about that afterwards as well, that a lot of women um, who come to us are also looking for a females-only space, or they really appreciate a safer space where they can just be around other women. Thank you very much, Lena. So as you've heard, we have very different uh, work um, realms, let's say, very different rooms of experiences, and we'd like to just jump right into the discussion. We're going to take about 15, 20 minutes to discuss a little bit amongst ourselves before opening and including all of you in the debate. Um, so let's pick up straight the point that you um, closed with. Um, and I'd like, like you all to join in, but I think I'll direct the question at you first. Um, sometimes we have to, or it seems that way, we'd have to be exclusive in order to increase inclusion or fairness. And if I understood you correctly, you've created a space that doesn't necessarily exclude anybody, but it doesn't put straight men in the focus. Um, can you explain a little bit exactly how you try to shape that community that you're working with and where, you're, where you drew the line of uh, inclusion and exclusion in your approach? Um, so we have a code of conduct. Everybody is welcome to come in the hackerspace as long as they apply to the code of conduct. Um, so we are open to everyone, but everything that we organize is directed to queer people and women. Um, so our communication is oriented towards them. Um, the workshops are organized uh, also by queer people and women. So basically we just don't care about straight men. But they can come. They can come. <laughs> Lena, you said one of your founders is a straight man, so that, that's something that you, um, you do differently. Yeah, we, are, um, we just started a year ago, so we are also still trying our different approaches. And um, I like what you said, that you're, um, I think you mentioned that they are invited if they want to come, but they are not you're not marketing for them. And I think you, um, yeah, you saw our, um, our logo. And in the first workshop that we run for kids, we said it's only for girls. And the second one, we said um, we are reserving a number of seats for girls because we want to um, increase diversity. And no boy is signed up. So from now on, we're not even putting it's only for girls um, on our flyers, but because it looks so girly, no boy is interested in, in joining us, apparently. And I think that's interesting because usually it works the other way around. So probably subconsciously or unconsciously, it's um, posters or uh, website look like they are made for, for boys or for guys and um, women don't feel attracted to it. And we do it the other way around and it works quite well. But yeah, but we also have... Um, men that are asking us, like, oh, we, we also like cocktails and cold, why can't we join? It's like, yeah, you, of course you can, you're welcome. Um, but, and we didn't have any negative experience with it so far. You're, you're going to be our academic sounding board <laughs> on this panel. In the research that you've conducted, do you see certain kinds of trends emerging or a sort of maybe perhaps a, a, a strength of certain strategies of those hackerspaces or communities or programs that try to specifically target, um, yeah, not straight men, but other mm -hmm. communities in, on, the, on the question of how inclusive, how exclusive do you have to be to, to be inclusive? Yeah. Um, so there's, I've been to spaces um, that are women only or women and non-binary people only, and they're really important for getting over the question of, like, well, is it just that women aren't interested, um, which is something that I've encountered in a few spaces. It's like, well, you know, we're not excluding women, they just don't seem to be interested, they're not coming here. And then when you provide a women-only space and women go there, then you can point to that and go, well, okay, that's just not true, there must be something about these other spaces that isn't including them. Um, but then the next step is how do you get that inclusion to work in an all-gender space? Because, like, we live in an all-gender world, and how do you take it out of those safer spaces and take it into other environments? Um, and there, there does need to be a specific aim um, to be inclusive. Um, it's interesting that you said, like, we don't exclude men, we just kind of don't focus stuff on them. And that seems to be um, 
the approach of makerspaces and hackerspaces in general, except there's no recognition of that. There's the, well, we don't exclude women, you know, they're just not here. Like, they could come here, and there's not the recognition that all of their presentation, like, all of their, their culture from the outside looks like it's geared towards men. So, of course, that's the kind of people that they, that they attract. Um, but, yeah, there isn't, it hasn't, they haven't made that decision, it's just what they're doing, and there's no recognition of it. Um, so, yeah, to change that, there does have to be um, a recognition that if you want to attract people from different groups, then you do need to reach out and specifically engage them. It's not going to just happen by itself. Thank you. Hong, how has it been um, for you in the last 10 years of managing FOSS Asia? Because there's another, um, another level that comes in it. You do this across different cultures and across different countries within Southeast Asia. How do you find um, that has developed over the last 10 years and how how much do you have to put an emphasis on trying to bring in not just women, but perhaps also people from different backgrounds into your community? Um, so, um, if you look at Southeast Asia and why look at the Force Asia community, we find diverse in, in inclusive. It will take forever to talk about different culture from Singapore, Malaysia. It's also related to the uh, religions and the, the culture of each country. But could I ask the Laura said um, hackers by a question? I was curious. I kind of have the same opinion with M. I I was curious. Was there any um, experience in the past that uh, motivated you to raise a base that or, or focus more on women instead of men? Is there any bad or experience or incident that occurred to you? Yes, yes of course. Yeah. Um, could you share a little bit about that? Because I also, like, for the past, uh, few, you know, that maybe I was lucky because in our community, I haven't experienced that much of uh, uh, kind of incident that make me feel that I need a space for myself. Because when I joined the open source community, I, I feel that everyone are very welcome. And also, people don't look at you as who you are. People always look at to your work and your contribution to the community. So sometimes you in the conversation, you don't even realize that you are with a bunch of uh, uh, other people from Europe or men. You just focus on the topic and the work that you do. So I'm curious to learn about the incident that you had before. Uh, I have a few. <coughs> I'm sorry. I have a few examples if you want, but. Um I think it's not about uh, what you can do or not, but it's about coming in the space and yeah. feeling that you can come here and uh, stay and be well um, welcomed. So as a woman, uh, actually, um, the I'm sorry, I'm a little sick. Um, the the people uh, were asking uh, if I came with my boyfriend, where, where he was. So they were wondering what I was doing here um, because I was a woman. So sorry, I don't have any boyfriend and will never have one, <laughs> but many your friends. So no. And um, um, also, um, I was waiting to to do lock picking mm -hmm. and uh, waiting in a line to to do that. When I came to the the tools. The guy said, oh, uh, sorry, you have to leave the place uh, for the guy, because I was just here to look, not to try. Oh. Many things like that I can... I so that lockpick it happened here at the Congress? Yeah, I know. Ah, oh, okay, so now we know what prevent women from joining the tech community. So maybe it wasn't in intentional... Uh, so you, I mean, I think it's really interesting what you said. When your community and the experience you have, you see the code and not the gender. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people here in the room, uh, who, I'm guessing, who came to the session, but also on the panel, have had really different experiences. But of course, this is really positive to hear. Maybe even a little bit surprising to hear, because perhaps there would have been maybe a stereotypical um, perception that in some of the societies, which are part of FOSS Asia, they're very traditional. Mm -hmm. And it's maybe not so typical um, for women to be, or uh, people who of different backgrounds, maybe, like I said, not just women, but also people of different educational backgrounds or different cultural backgrounds to be part of this community. But of course, it's very nice to hear that you've had a very different experience. Um, let's, I think a key word that we've heard um, from many of you, and you also mentioned your core values, is empowerment and creating empowerment, empowering experiences for others. Um, you've already said a little bit about how you try to do that and giving people space to create their own narratives. Do you want to share a little bit more what have been like successes for you where you notice this has been working for your community? Uh, 
I think um, one of the um, women who came to our meetup um, afterwards, um, she came to us and, and she was really happy and she said like, okay, I have a place where I can be among my geek friends and talk about geeky stuff and I have my feminist friends to whom I can come and talk about feminist stuff and, but I never had both. So I have friends and I think it's also important that you mentioned that it wasn't, it probably wasn't intentional when someone asked you like, hey, where's your boyfriend? Maybe it was trying to start a conversation, but that doesn't make it any better. It's like... Mm, I'm not sure of that. No, okay, okay. <laughs> That's even worse, but yeah. I mean, I can also say like, I have the same experience regularly and it's in a, even in spaces where I've been a member for years and that I really love dearly. And, um, and I think, you know, you sort of, or at least me personally, I never try to take offense, but of course it is offensive. And, and, and this is something we had a quick chat about, your level of tolerance for this, the threshold of acceptance, is for me at least becomes less and less. And I think we had a quick conversation and one of the key words was patience. So when you have um, tried to sort of, um, yeah, already create spaces that are different for communities like all of ours that are different, you want, a, you know, you expect more, basically. You expect people to be better at this game and things to change faster. So I think the sort of level of frustration that builds up when you find it's not changing, as you know, just as you said in your talk, it's shocking to hear that that level of apprehension of including women and doing things to actually really support women coming in and making sure all parts of society are equally represented is still that strong. Do you, have you looked into like the why a little bit in your research? Like something that's really interesting is that um, the absence of groups like people with disabilities is more readily seen as something that can be um, helped by changing the space, um, by introducing kind of um, ramps, wheelchair access uh, technologies, um, rearranging the space so that it's more accessible. But then when it comes to cultural aspects, such as including women, that's seen as something that's unchangeable. So spaces are often willing to change to be more diverse, um, but they have kind of a mental block on being able to include people like women or people of color who they see as more kind of there's no way that these groups can come and join us. They're just not interested. And it's like, that's a very unusual thing to see. So you mentioned earlier that you have a code of conduct. Um, and, and I think that's, I'd love to hear like, how did you develop this code of conduct for your community? And is this sort of a living thing? Did you come up with this in the beginning and it's been set like that? Or is it something that you revise and how do you implement it? Mm, actually, it's a really simple code of conduct with ten uh, phrases, ten sentences, and um, uh, it says not to discriminate anybody and to respect boundaries and things that are make us uh, all live together well. But uh, the the important thing is that uh, we we endorse it really, so we we. We put it on the walls. We we talk about it, and we uh, observe the dynamics uh, into the hacker space. Uh, what do people do? Uh, how do they feel? We welcome them. Uh, we 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 apply uh, ethics of, of care. That, that's the, the things I was talking uh, about. Um, we we help people, but we do not do things. Um, on their behalf, we do not speak for the persons, but we are here to support if they need, and that's how it works. So are there many cases where you find you need to mediate, or have you had cases where you've had to exclude people based on your code of conduct? Um, we haven't excluded many people, but we feel totally fine with, with having to exclude someone. We're not afraid of it. But usually we try to talk to the person before we have to get them out, like um, remind them of the, of the code of conduct. And uh, um, our code of conduct is uh, something that we have to apply, but it's also full of keywords. And so the idea is that every time we're um, saying that we're organizing a workshop or doing a conference, we talk about it and we tell people to read it before they come so that they also can Google the words that they don't know, so that they come in the hackerspace and they know uh, what it means to actually uh, respect somebody's 
pronouns or things like this. So how would you all balance sort of the mission of what your spaces are there to do and what your communities are there to do in terms of creating safe space for the people that you have as part of your community and educating the rest of the world? Oh, I can say something. Okay. So, um, uh, so code of conduct is a, a, a good way to ensure that a safe space for, for people um, in terms of um, inclusiveness. So there. So I think that in order to solve this problem, so at first, it's a good uh, way that we bring people together who can talk um, about the challenges and inc incidents that they had uh, in the past, so that the people in the audience also are aware that they might not uh, uh, intentionally uh, raise this question, but now people are aware what could be offense to to another members. But I think one of the biggest challenges is that the people in the community, sometimes people are not aware of um, the level the difference of background of different uh, people in the community. For instance, I want to give one example. So uh, when you visit one of the hackers bay uh, in Singapore, normally when you come in, even though this, this is your first time enter the hackers bay, nobody would come uh, and talk to you, try to in introduce to you the, 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 the space, what are the equipment, because they assume that you already have the knowledge. If you enter the hackers bay, you know everything. And sometimes I, I find a little bit um, in, intimidated that I did not understand some joke that made by my male colleague because they have different kind of knowledge coming from the West, from, from Europe, or America. So it's very important that we are aware that people coming from different backgrounds, so something that you think that is so obvious to you might not be obvious to people, and it might raise uh, some kind of conflict and misunderstanding. So if we are all aware that um, that piece of knowledge we have might not uh, be relevant to another person and always be aware, but be more flex uh, flexible, then uh, that could be less uh, uh, complex in the community, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So again, like, yes, you're free to applaud. <laughs> <laughs> How do you try to balance that? <sighs> um, we welcome everybody that comes into the space, so like, we're here every Sunday, so we usually know who has come before and who hasn't, and every time we see a new person, uh, there is always someone who comes and explains the code of conduct, but also like, what is this space, um, where you can find the stickers, where is the workshop, so we explain everything. I think that sounds really nice. Like, I think from what you've explained, there's a lot of magic in that very personal approach. You know, it's not that you're... Um, like, you know, <laughs> taking people's space when they come in, but it's like this taking care of each other and looking out for one another, which should be part of respectful human conduct, no matter what kind of human you are, right? Um, maybe one last topic on the panel before we open up a little bit, um, or maybe one or two. I, th I thought it was really interesting to read on one of the little um, things on your slide. Um, I really like the one that said AI, um, I was writing too fast, now I can't read my own writing. AI is just privileged people's choice. Um, so, in my experience, very often we, we, we create spaces like yours or like the community you're creating with the mind of creating, bringing in new people and giving people who maybe haven't had um, sort of the typical tech career, a chance to explore and see that they can be the creators of technology themselves. But we end up also creating kind of bubbles in usually attracting people with a certain background, usually creating spaces with people. We live in Europe with like, you know, middle class white communities, and that's also um, perhaps not the levelest of playing fields when it comes to creating inclusive technology. Is that something that you address in your spaces? I'm not looking at you specifically because it's a little bit of a different intercultural um, setting that you have with FOSS Asia, but how does that come into play when we talk about diversity in, in your experiences? Um, actually, we we are located in a in a queer bar, so the the people that uh, are used to come to this bar to party and meet up and date, uh, they also come on Sundays. So uh, we have um, uh, people that that would never enter a space. 
in, in other times. So we have um, um, actually ma many women, uh, uh, many trans, trans people and, and queer people. Uh, one, one time we had uh, this girl who never touched a computer. Uh, we have people who have never played video games um, and so on. So we have really diverse uh, public. I think that's also interesting because that was mentioned before the setting of where your space actually yeah, is, which is a really important factor of how to make spaces accessible to different communities as well. Um, how is that for the space that you help found? Yeah, so this is such a tricky question. Like particularly with volunteer-run spaces, you have a limited amount of time and energy, and do you spend that on educating people, or do you spend it on engaging with people who can use your resources? And I lean towards the engagement. Um, I feel that it's important to kind of get people in and to share what we already have with other groups. Um, there are resources out there where people can educate themselves. Um, like people in technology communities are like very intelligent people. Like they are more than capable of kind of finding other resources and educating themselves. Um, and if the group has the capacity um, for example, to run workshops around specific issues, around uh, consent, around kind of introductions to feminism and other topics, um, then that's great. And that can be a great way of um, educating our own community and also um, taking those ideas into the outside community. Um, but yeah, I think if it was, um, if time was limited, then I would definitely want to dedicate more to engagement rather than educating um, people who are capable of educating themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah, About that education, um, our hackerspace has been invited to give Feminism 101 talks, like, a lot. And um, so we answered yes to those invitations, and then we did not do Feminism 101 because we believe that there has been enough talks about Feminism 101 already, and there is plenty of things available of the, on the internet. So we, ha we make um, uh, usually talks about um, ethics of care or cyber feminism, and we have, uh, every time we go somewhere, we have a wiki page about it with all the links about um, uh, a four lines uh, definition on Wikipedia or, or a, a, a 40 pages PDF that you can download or podcast. So all the Feminism 101 and all the education has already been done. So we are making sure that it's accessible and then we're moving on because as you said, we don't have this energy to do again and again what others have done before us. Yeah, especially. I think you mentioned it already, uh, and I, I think you're also working voluntarily, or a, a lot of volunteers come in, so do they have the time and the energy? And for me, it's also sometimes I'm just not in the mood to mm. explain everything again, like the really one-on-one stuff. And, um, but other times when, when I feel like someone is really curious and um, really wants to learn something and is um, respectful and is not trying to, um, yeah, provoke a discussion just to have a discussion because then um, yeah I don't know with, with some persons I feel like okay for him it might be a fun discussion just to I don't know just to test the borders and see how far you can go but for me it's like okay I'm I'm talking if I have um, the, the right to be here as a woman and I don't always feel like I want to discuss that. Your patience level is going down as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, how is it for you? How do you try to engage people in open source communities that perhaps wouldn't normally walk into a hackerspace or don't yet know about the work that you do? Um, it's okay. I think. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I found it for Asia, and then for me it was, it was quite lucky because the founder of the organization is a female, so it also have um, make other people feel more uh, comfortable to engage with the open source community. But I think as M and uh, um, Luca also and uh, Lina also said that uh, less. Uh, the, the number of women who um, uh, work in the tech community is still uh, very small. And I think it's important to um, uh, 
to, uh, to understand that when you talk about technology, it's not only about coding because there's so many different responsibility and, uh, and possibility that could, you could engage uh, the, uh, the women or the other or the, or the, um, community members in the community. So it's important to have uh, the, the guidelines to, 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 to have people a lot of good documentation to show people that by joining the community, the first step, you did not have to, to fix a bug or to write uh, a line of code in order to join the community. You can do translation, you can do design, localization, there are many things that any single one of us can be involved and can uh, contribute um, as our uh, space. So I think that is one step to lower the, the barriers to enter the um, community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to start opening up for your questions and for comments. We have, I think, two microphones here in the center of the room, and, and you're first. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, think, first of all, thank you girls very much for this session. Um, I can relate to that. Uh, we are, so to say, from the same club. Uh, I came from Estonia. Uh, from Estonia, and there uh, I'm the organizer of the conference Women in Cybersecurity, and uh, also head of uh, Google Women Tech Makers uh, in Estonia. And um, I can relate to a lot of things which you have mentioned, but what I'm really interested, because you're from different countries, is, um, um, and Ms. Dong has answered this question partially, but I'm interested in other answers. Uh, how do you actually attract more women into IT, not from the marketing perspective, but from the perspective of your uh, mission, of your hacker space or your community. And uh, how do you make those people stay and come to the events, or if not come to the events, how do you make them um, thinking of that and continuing studying? Yeah, and uh, the success story, that is something what we all would be really interested in hearing. Because, uh, for example, from Ms. Dong's uh, story, we can uh, see the open source projects. I guess still a lot of girls might have been involved there and the hotel and other projects. But what about the Europe? Tell us. That's very curious. Thank you. Thank you very much. Should we collect a couple and then do a round, or how would you like to do it? I can remind the questions <laughs> if needed. Uh, how do you attract, uh, how do you keep people? Uh, and how do you end the success stories? Okay, thank you. Um, so let's do that. Do you have your community, is it very fluctuating or do you have a kind of stable group of people? Do you ever have a problem oh. connecting them back to your space? So I just, before uh, we start from the answers of uh, ladies, um, there is something else I wanted to mention. I also come not okay, from There's the a long queue behind you. Oh. And and we've already collected a couple of questions, so maybe just one more sentence. Of course, yeah, thank you. No, then go ahead for the answers. Okay, thank you. So. Your, how long term is your community? How much does it fluctuate? How, how do you sort of keep people? Um, we have people that come like every Sunday, and we have people who come just for one workshop because they've been interested in that topic. Um, what we do to attract people is that we, we um, every Sunday we have a workshop, at least one workshop, so people are usually interested in the topic or just interested in meeting new people, but they always know that they won't just stand there and have nobody to talk to. There is a workshop, like they have a purpose for being here. Um, and, and because the topics are always oriented towards women and queer, we don't have any issue attracting uh, women and queers in the hackerspace. We've never had uh, a majority of straight male in the hackerspace. That has never happened. Thank you. Um, is that similar in your experience? Uh, well, I mean, it's a huge question. How do you attract women to IT and retain them? Um, just to keep my answer fairly short, um, one particular tip I have is and to get a bit academic for a second, kind of focus on developing like the social bonds within your community rather than necessarily the tech aspects. Um, like when people have friends and people they care about in this community, they're much more likely to 
um, to join it and want to stay there and to get more out of it. Um, so sometimes focusing on things that seem quite tangential, like uh, socializing, people spending time together like outside of the, um, the physical space and kind of doing like fun non-tech things together like can actually uh, do that job of bringing like more women and femme people in and helping them to feel comfortable and welcome there. There's a challenge maybe the other way around too. In my experience, um, if for, many, for many people, spaces like the ones that you create become a home. And, and so sort of the keeping people, having people want to be part of that home is not so hard. But making sure that you remain open for new people to sort of join that family and feel as equally welcome can sometimes be a, a, an even bigger challenge than, yeah, just attracting people and keeping them in the beginning. Next question. So my question will mostly be related to this mergery of the feminist uh, hackerspaces and the male hackerspaces. So I see that you are making spaces for women and for queer to, to get creative, but uh, making these separate from other hackerspaces is a bit of an isolation, and I guess this would be a next step to merge these kind of uh, societies. So my in the, from a male perspective, it's sometimes hard to understand what female don't find attractive or find uh, distracting about joining male societies, because feminist uh, activism usually do not target male to, to express what the problem is. So what do you think that could be done to, towards this mergery? So to make women try to get involved in male hacker spaces and to make men uh, more uh, acceptive to f female, um, so this merger to get involved together. I hope my question was understandable. <laughs> you can all feel free. <laughs> I don't think our goal is to merge our hacker spaces. Um, we are creating hacker spaces around our issues. If you want to come, you're welcome. But what you will find here is things that concern us. But of course, you're welcome. And um, <laughs> we don't have any interest in your issues, so we're not coming to your hacker spaces. But I don't yeah. know. I understand this, <laughs> and I, I don't think that what you do is wrong. I just think that uh, this is a sort of isolation between two different kinds of creative energy. Let's. So. Uh, I think you've been in isolation much more longer than us. I mean, uh, uh, probably separation, not isolation. Let's. There's again. I'm going to say there are many people queuing okay. behind you. So um, and and we do want to get in a conversation with everyone, but we want to give everybody the chance to speak as well. Um, I think it's. A, let's. I'm going to rephrase your question, if I may, when it comes to the actual creation of technology, uh, because I think. Let's see if they're two separate things or not. The one thing is that you have a community and you have a space for that community and you want to prioritize the issues of your community. The other question is when we create technology and we create technology for the general public, how do we ensure that that technology is created by the public, as in all members of that public, and then reflects all of our values equally? I don't believe in the general public. Sorry? I don't believe in the general public. <laughs> so, um, I could answer your question. Um, I also don't want to give comment about if we are uh, marching the two uh, roof, but if you want to make your space, any hacker space that more welcome to, to women or any member. So the first thing, just like in a normal context, if you have a new guest coming from your home, the first thing is that to show the guest around, like to, to, to interact with, with the person and to, to be patient and, 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 and show them what they can do. And also one thing that I mentioned earlier, because different people have different background and knowledge, so it's more important important for um, that to find out what is their motivation to, to get to know uh, the people better so make this more make it feel more um, the, the women feel more comfortable to come you to your space instead of like asking them to 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 merge together with another space just create a more friendly environment in your space by just approach the people the newcomers and welcome them mm. So 
Sorry, next person, please. Uh, so I have some more of an experience to share than a question. Uh, I organize uh, events for geeks, and they are very male uh, heavy, let's say. Uh, and what I found is uh, when it comes to disabled, disabled people and uh, that the community is uh, more likely to actually change is because then they change environment and they don't have to change themselves. Mm -hmm. The huge problem usually is that the male populated hacker space or generally community in general feel that when they uh, have to open to uh, female presence or gay presence, uh, etc. They have to change their own behavior, and that is not something they are willing to do. Mm. Sadly enough. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Was there a question in there you just wanted to share? Okay, it's good. Thank you. There's an online question we'd like to take next, please. Uh, the question was answered. Oh. <laughs> okay then. <laughs> in that case. Um. Hello. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for all of your great work. Uh, I just uh, uh, want to have a question about something that uh, maybe a little bit missed in this uh, conversation. Uh, so we talked about all of the communities and the hacker spaces that uh, focused on uh, were, uh, were women and non-binaries. But uh, imagine a scenario that there is a company or there is like a startup, and they are um, there is not much diversity, and we want to prove like. Uh, a presentation of uh, people of marginalized group or anything, uh, how we can achieve that? How there are lots of uh, suggestions like hire people who are like visible to others, to be very open about this and try to uh, attract more people. But is there any sort of way to talk to get? Uh, there's successful stories about to improve the diversity of. Uh, uh, companies and startups and other types of communities? Thank you. Um, I think it's um, often you have biases sometimes in the hiring process. So maybe you go through different CVs of different persons and then you, um, I, I only know examples from Germany, but I guess it's the same everywhere if you um, read a CV, CV with a name that sounds foreign to you, you might put it to the side or might automatically think, okay, maybe this person is not equally capable, even if the skills are the same. And um, also in your job descriptions, you can make sure that it's more inclusive, so you don't say like, okay, the perfect person, <laughs> he should have this and that, but you put he and she. Um, and I think a lot of times it's about really, really subtle changes and small things. And um, like you said, it's a change of the mindset. So it's... Yeah, um, please. Actually, uh, in the reset, we, we do not value uh, success stories at all. We don't care. We value uh, partnership, partnership and um, being well together. And that's what works, actually. We do many things, but not by pushing things uh, to be a woman -y or query or whatever. We do what we want to do, what we, we like, and that works. That's just that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Maybe we can exchange after this. Oh, there's a lot of great um, written works already out there that give advice to companies and startups that want to be more inclusive. But like the, the simplest thing, if, like you said it yourself, if you want to be inclusive, have an inclusive team. You cannot have an inclusive or diverse startup if your team are all men. And, um, and the excuse that you didn't find the right people out there doesn't really go either, because like you said, then maybe you're looking the wrong way. And if you seriously can't find anybody with the skill set you're looking for, then help, build, help people build that skill set. So there are always ways to actually do that in your team. Please. Hi. Hi. Six, six of you proposed talks. We got one talk. Yes, you are six awesome women. It's an awesome topic. We've got an audience of roughly 50-50. It's one of the most balanced audiences I've seen at this entire event. But I'm pretty certain that the men in here are majority male allies. The women, you're preaching to the perverted here. Why is it that we have allowed ourselves to be gerrymandered in this way? 
Why do we have only one session? Why do we not have six sessions? Why? <laughs> Adams, Borg, Clark, Dykstra. The meeting rooms are named after men. Women are 50-50 of the population. Why are we allowing this to happen? I appreciate I'm looking you in the eye, and I'm guilty here of preaching to perverted too. But why are we allowing it? Why is it happening? It's 2018. It's soon to be 2019. We deserve better. Thank you, thank you very much for, for your concern. Um, but I think, that, don't you think that it's good to bring people together? Because of course, like we can have separate section, but it's also very good to have everyone come together and share their opinions, so we can have the conversation, which we can learn from each other. So again, the, the Congress is very busy. Not everyone can come to every single talk. Maybe we will not be able to attend all our uh, friends or, or, or the panelists here, but it's good that we can come all together. So they are always pro and con. But thank you very much for your concern. We have exactly time for one last uh, question or intervention, and that shall be you. Thank you. Thank you for the talk, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm probably in the category of a straight male engineer, um, but I also, more or less, but, uh, but I also have, I'm running a co-working space in Copenhagen, uh, and I'm specifically focusing on making it inclusive. So I'll be trying to find uh, information and tips on how to do that. But I have two other questions then. Um, what would be your, your top three action points on ending the digital gender divide? Uh, it's a big, uh, big topic, I know. It's <laughs> <laughs> just a small question for the end of the session. Yeah, yeah. And you had a second one, even? Yeah, the second one was... Um, <laughs> I guess that's, I mean, I, I really see the, the, the points being raised about designing, I mean, just down to the level of design, designing a website uh, targeted to a male audience versus targeted to a female audience. Um, okay, the second question was, was, uh, yeah, what was that? <laughs> um, Uh, the first Asia. Um, in Asia, I read an article uh, lately from the After Access magazine about internet usage throughout the global south. And it's this. In Asia, you have like 20% of the population on the internet. Do you see that as a problem? And what do you think uh, could be done about that? Okay, so how do we close the digital divide as such, and how do we close the gender divide specifically? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I just want to announce that uh, Aim suggested uh, we have an um, after-panel uh, discussion, so we hosted uh, a follow-up discussion at the Force Asia Assembly after this. If you want to have more questions and you want to continue the conversation, we can meet there at 8.15? Uh, 8.15 to 9.15. Okay. <laughs> So we're not dodging your question, or we're just going to move it to that meetup. <laughs> I hope that's okay, as we have run out of time. But I would like to end maybe with a little bit of a closing round, because uh, I think um, I think this came out uh, of a number of statements that you made. Um, and you specifically, of course, work uh, as a leader of an open source community, which is on shared resources. So um, you mentioned it a lot of times, so you're putting your resources out there, and they're out there for other people to share and to learn from. I'd be interested in a little bit of a cl closing round of um, either recommendations, reading recommendations, places to go look for further information, maybe places where you're going to be publishing your research, but also the question of connecting, like how do we strengthen each other's work, not just by coming together at conferences like this, but by making our knowledge open and sharing it, and perhaps also exchanging experiences with one another. So if maybe you want to leave with an idea or a recommendation or a point of inspiration or a question um, on that issue, let's do a quick round. Do you want to start? Um, so we're quite lucky in the UK that we have the UK Hackspace Foundation, 
um, which is a kind of umbrella group for the 70-odd hacker spaces in the UK. Um, and these kind of organizations can be great for raising discussions about these topics. Um, I'm really pushing to have more of a focus on inclusivity and diversity in the UK Hackspace Foundation at the moment, and that can be a way of kind of funneling best practices out through all of the member organizations. Thank you. Um, I think for us, it's, uh, we really focus on, like you mentioned as well, on the personal connections. So, um, yeah, we would, of course, prefer that you visit us for Cocktails of Code. And I think there are a lot of, um, almost every, yeah, I think especially in the bigger cities, you will find a feminist or women only or women and non binary people only space. And if there's none, maybe then you should find one because I think it's, it's really important and I think it happens a lot through personal connections. Thank you, Lena. Yeah, so the same thing. Uh, you all are welcome at our uh, open source hotel in Vietnam if you ever <laughs> want to visit, and uh, welcome at any Force Asia uh, events. Uh, the same, the, at the same time, I think that um, uh, we could share our best practices and uh, um, the successful story on our website. Uh, what we do, so whatever Force Asia develop and what we do, we publish everything. So I think that is a good way to share resources with other communities and. Panel discussion is always good to learn and to continue the conversation. It's definitely a good one with you guys. Yeah. Sora? There is only one thing to do, is to go to our wiki. We have all the resources that you need in French. <laughs> <laughs> our website is English. <laughs> So yeah, we will try um, um, as uh, after this uh, conference in the CCC, we, we will try to uh, put the video on our wiki with a, a page with all the references as we do usually in French, and so we will do it in English this time. So you should find it in a few days uh, on our wiki, which is wiki.lereset.org. Excellent. I would like to thank you all for handing in um, such great ideas for this event, for sitting on this panel and sharing your thoughts and experiences. Thank you, Ajem. Thank you, Zora. Thank you, Hong. Thank you, Lena. And thank you, Em, uh, for being part of the session. Thank you all for attending and your inputs and ideas as well. And let's say a big thank you to the stage host and the translators for doing a wonderful job as well.